Alright, let's talk about glycolysis regulation. Now, in the previous video, I talked about, you know, the pathway. I showed each of the ten steps. I described the ten steps. I showed the important steps and discussed a little bit of detail about each one. Now, while I said memorizing all the steps, understanding all the steps, and being able to draw them all out, and all the intermediates, and all the um, enzymes is a useful skill but it's not essential to understanding glycolysis. What is essential is understanding regulation, okay? How these metabolic pathways are regulated. That is what really gives you that intuitive understanding of what's going on with metabolism. Whether we're talking about metabolizing, you know, sugars, or we're talking about metabolizing proteins, or we're talking about metabolizing fats, um, they all are very similar in the way that they're regulated. They're all very similar in the way that they're designed. Um, you know, there are some differences, of course. I don't want to be too broad here. But we'll talk about those. So let's start about, and, and this can be extended even to genetics. I mean, a lot of gene regulation is involving regulatory proteins and how that regulation interacts with the different, with, with, with um, being able to, say, differentiate cells, the ability to differentiate cells. So like when, you're, when development is going on and we want to have a muscle cell, you know, how does that be, how does, a, how does the genetics, how do those genes, all the DNA, okay, that encodes the entire organism. How does that work? How do I turn on just the genes necessary to make this particular cell a muscle cell? Okay, so this has far-reaching implications. Anyway, let's talk about glycolysis regulation. So, as I said before, there's 10 steps in glycolysis, and these 10 steps, there are three that involve large negative delta G values, okay? So large negative free energy values that are essentially irreversible. Anytime you see a large negative um, delta G, you can assume they're met what they call metabolically irreversible. Okay, they are reversible in a sense, but not, not, not relative to what we're talking about, okay? And the delta G values are obviously negative in this case, and they're also usually the reactions that require ATP. Okay, and remember I said there's two reactions that require ATP, so, and those are sort of the priming phase of glycolysis. It requires two ATP molecules at the first step and the third step. Okay, and that's exactly what I'm going to say here. So the irreversible steps are step one, which is the phosphorylation of glucose to make glucose 6-phosphate, okay? The second irreversible step is step three, okay? And that's the phosphorylation of fructose 6-phosphate to make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now that's an essential molecule. You might remember what I said about it. It's the first unique product, okay? It has to go back through glycolysis. It's also the rate limiting step, okay? So extremely important. The final step, the tra where the, we transfer a phosphate group to fo from phosphorylenol pyruvate to make ATP and pyruvate, okay? That's also regulated. And that also has a large negative delta G, okay? So those are the three reactions. So it's, it's the first step, the third step, 10th step, okay? And the enzymes that catalyze these reactions, this is important. You got to know what enzymes are catalyzing these reactions because this is these are, the enzymes are what's going to be regulated. Okay, so the enzymes that catalyze these reactions are hexokinase for step one. Okay, that's the phosphorylation of glucose, phosphofructokinase one for step three, and that and that's um, the phosphorylation of fructose six phosphate, and pyruvate kinase for step ten. Okay. These are the primary steps of allosteric regulation, okay? These are primary steps for allosteric regulation. That's where a small molecule binds to a site other than the active site, induces a conformational change in the enzyme, which either activates the enzyme, makes it more likely to bind substrate, or deactivates it less likely, okay? Lowers the affinity. Generally, enzymes that catalyze essentially irreversible steps in metabolic pathways are potential sites for allosteric regulation. So anytime you see a large negative delta G in a metabolic pathway, I don't care what metabolic pathway it is, you, you, you might want to start thinking about regulation. There's always a possibility for regulation to be going on there. So now what I want to do is go through each enzyme, okay? I want to go through the details for each one and which which allosteric regulators are inhibitors, which are activators. So hexakinase is the first, it catalyzes the first step, okay? And hexakinase catalyzes the phosphorylation of glucose. It has a low KM, okay? A low KM means a high affinity for glucose. So this thing is binding glucose, even at very low affinity, I mean low concentrations of glucose, rather. And it permits regulation of glycolysis when the concentrations of glucose are low. 
So hexokinase is inhibited by its product, glucose 6-phosphate. Now that's probably the most important factor. That's, a, that's what's known as feedback inhibition, okay, or product inhibition. Um, you know, this is this come this product that we're making, glucose 6-phosphate, then comes back to, you know, allosterically bind with hexokinase and inhibit it, okay? So this is a very important regulatory step since it prevents the overconsumption of cellular ATP, okay? It makes perfect intuitive sense. If I have enough ATP in the in cell, okay, I have plenty of ATP, I have plenty of energy, there's no reason for me to keep going through glycolysis, okay? The goal of glycolysis is to make ATP, okay? The point of glycolysis is to make ATP. And of course, pyruvate, which can go on to make acetyl-CoA and enter the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, etc., etc. But the point is to make ATP. It's to create energy, okay? So if I have plenty of energy, why would I want to create it? Simple as that. Okay, so that leads us to the next point here, which is that the other inhibitor is ATP. Okay, ATP. If concentrations of ATP are high, hexokinase is inhibited. All right, it's not going to be operating as efficiently if ATP is high, only if ATP is low. So then that actually leads into the next part, the activators. Okay, so hexokinase, the activators of hexokinase are AMP and glucose. Makes perfect sense. AMP is only going to be found in the cell or in high concentrate high intercellular concentrations when the energy levels are low okay and if your energy levels are low you got to go through glycolysis you got to start making ATP all right that's the whole point here and obviously glucose I mean glucose is just obvious that's the substrate okay anytime you start adding substrate you generally increase the activity of an enzyme you start giving in, you start putting more and more substrate in there, higher and higher concentration, things are going to start going in the, in the proper direction. The reaction is going to start moving forward. Okay, so you can see how this all kind of ties together. ATP is an inhibitor, okay? It's inhibiting glycolysis because there's plenty of energy. Why would we need to make more? But if there's no energy or the cellular energy is low, AMP is available, high concentration of AMP, then we're going to, then we're going to start, you know, increasing the activity. Hexokinase. So it makes perfect intuitive sense here. And, that, and that's kind of what I want to show you guys, the intuitive approach here. The next enzyme to talk about is phosphofructokinase, okay, or PFK1. Sometimes they call it PFK1, you could just call it PFK, okay. Phosphofructokinase, okay, it catalyzes the rate limiting step. I already said that. It catalyzes the rate limiting step of in glycolysis, okay, so this is an extremely important control point. You want to control the rate limiting step because once I make fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, I have to go through the rest of the reaction to glycolysis. I have no other option, okay? So, you're, of course, you're going to want to control that molecule that's being produced at that point, okay? Especially if you want to control how much energy the cell has. You don't want to just be... The thing about life is that it requires a delicate balance, okay? We don't want to be using energy to do things, to, to go through metabolic processes that we don't need to go through, okay? That's the bottom line. Where Things are naturally lazy. Okay, I always made the, 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 the funny joke about um, in organic chemistry that, you know, when you see a molecule, it would like to be laying down, okay? It wants to be in the lowest possible energy state. It doesn't want to waste energy, okay? So, PFK is allosterically inhibited by ATP. Again, what a coincidence. If we, it, you know, if we're going through glycolysis, we're making ATP, we're generating energy. If we have enough energy, we have enough ATP, why would we need to go through glycolysis? Perfectly intuitive, Okay. So ATP inhibits it, and glycolysis is slowed when cellular ATP concentrations are high, okay? And that should say ATP binds to PFK enzyme at a, and causes a conformational change in the enzyme. So that's all I'm saying. An allosteric regulator, it binds to a site other than the active site, changes the conformation of the enzyme, and, and um, you know, either increases or decreases its affinity, okay, for the substrate. So... It's also inhibited by citrate. And you might say to me, well, what does citrate have to do with it? We haven't talked about that. Yeah, well, citrate is, you know, one of the products you're going to have in the, in the citric acid cycle, okay? And basically what that's telling you is that the cell has plenty of energy. If I have a lot of citrate around, again, I have high energy levels. Why? It's most likely due to the breakdown of fats, okay? Your fatty acid oxidation known as beta oxidation, okay? That's what's going on there. If there's plenty of citrate around, citric acid cycles ramped up, and it's likely ramped up due to the breakdown of, um, of um, lipids, okay? Or beta oxidation, okay?
So moving to the next part here, come on down, and we'll talk about P PFK a little more. So PFK is activated, okay, when cellular energy is low, okay, when AMP levels are high, the cell in the cell PFK is activated. Okay, that's perfectly intuitive. Again, energy levels are low. I want to upregulate glycolysis. I want to start making ATP. Another allosteric activator is fructose 2 6 bisphosphate. Okay, and that's different than what we've seen before. It's extremely important though. Fructose 2 6 bisphosphate is not common. Okay, it's not a, it's not an intermediate in it's not an intermediate in glycolysis. All right, but what's interesting about it is it can actually overcome the effects of um, ATP. So if ATP is inhibiting, we can actually add this and um, move on through. Okay. So I just got a couple of graphs here that I just want to briefly show. All right. I didn't draw them all out, but what I have here is velocity and concentration of fructose 6-phosphate. And what I wanted to show is just how different the graphs look if you have high levels of ATP and if ATP is low. So if my ATP is high, what I'm going to wind up with is something more like this, okay? So this is high ATP, okay? So that's high ATP. So if I have a high ATP concentration, I got more of a sigmoidal curve. If I have low ATP, well, guess what? The enzyme's functioning more efficiently. It's going to look something like that, okay? So if I have low ATP, then I'm going to wind up with something that looks a little different. Right. It's going to be more sigmoidal than, uh, I mean, more sigmoidal, more, more hyperbolic, excuse me. Now, the other one here is PFK K activity and, again, fructose 6-phosphate concentration here. So this graph is a little different because what I'll show is no inhibition, then I'll show ATP at different molar concentrations, okay? So here's my initial. Okay, so this is just a rough graph again. So this is no inhibitor. Okay, so this is no inhibitor. All right, now if I start adding ATP, what's going to happen? Well, my graph is going to change slightly, of course. It's going to look something more like this. So this is about zero, uh, zero, one millimolar. Okay, one millimolar of ATP. Okay, so it's going to be a little different. It's going to be a little less active. Okay, now if I add even more ATP, I'm going to wind up with that sort of sigmoidal shape here. So this will say is, I don't know, 10 millimolar ATP. Okay, so as I add ATP, the bottom line is the graph is going to shift to the right. Okay, and the activity is going to be a little bit decreased. All right, so I just wanted to kind of show those two graphs, just give you a little bit of an idea of what's going on before I move on to pyruvate kinase. Okay, and the final enzyme to talk about is pyruvate kinase. This catalyzes the tenth step, and it's activated by, look, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. What a surprise. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is the committed molecule of glycolysis. It makes perfect sense that it's going to be that it's going to activate, okay, pyruvate kinase, because what that's going to do is that's going to signal to this enzyme that's way down the line, listen up, something's going on here, things are starting to ramp up, you better get ready to start being more active, you better get ready to start increasing your activity, and that's exactly what it's doing, that's exactly what's going on here, okay. Also, pyruvate kinase is inhibited by ATP, alanine, and acetyl-CoA, okay. Now, acetyl-CoA, that's again coming from citric acid cycle, and if there's plenty of acetyl-CoA, there's plenty of energy. That means there's plenty of citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, something like 30, 32 ATPs, somewhere, depending on what cell it's occurring in, of course. Um, it could, it could be as low as 28, too. But anyway, it's not the point. The point is that, um... Acetyl-CoA means we have high energy conditions. We don't need more energy, no need to go through glycolysis. Um, alanine is an interesting case. You might wonder, why, the, why is alanine even in here? So in my last 30 seconds, I'm going to hope to explain it, okay? And the reason for alanine, the reason alanine is an inhibitor is because it's easily converted to pyruvate, okay? And again, if pyruvate is high, the concentration of pyruvate is high, then that means the cell has plenty of energy. There's no need to keep making pyruvate, okay? Because remember, we make two pyruvates when we go through glycolysis. No need to keep doing that at this point, okay? 
So just remember those things. Hopefully this is helpful.